בשם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, ברוך השם, good to be back, sunny isles, florida, glad to see that a few of you actually showed up today and you're not so scared of the rain, uh, it, don't worry, rain does not kill, it doesn't kill, so you guys are safe, once it touches you, you're okay, you survived the week, you don't have to take a tetanus shot, nothing, it's, uh, it's the same stuff that comes out of the uh, shower, same stuff, same stuff. No, no, but I mean, it's seriously, in Florida, it's a, uh, you know, actually, it's the same thing in other places. People are scared of rain. As soon as it rains, people's lives stop. Uh, I remember as a kid, as soon as we saw snow outside in New York, we're all excited. Why? We knew the schools were going to be shut down. It's the most exciting news you can get first thing in the morning is there was snowing outside. That means no school. Anyway, with other we have our questions and answers series. Um... We, with uh, Hashem, today's shiur will be for Ilu uh, Nishmat David ben Masuda, also for Refua Shlema of David ben Nasriya, Levana bat Sara, Doris bat Jora, Viola bat Jora, Elisheb Achaya bat Sara, Dvora bat Mercedes, Rav Ephraim ben Shulamit, Rabbanit Sara bat Anat. Elad ben Doris, and all of Am Yisrael Bezot Hashem will have Refuah Shlema, Refuah Nefesh, Refuah Taguf. So uh, since it's a questions and answers, uh, Shio, I mean, I have, Baruch Hashem, plenty of information to talk about. We can talk about Parashat Shavua, that there's a lot of really interesting uh, Musar and uh, Chidushim we can learn from it. There's a, uh, some other things that I want to bring up, but uh, today, Baruch Hashem, there's a, the biggest Chidushes that a couple of you actually have questions. From the beginning of the shul, that's the biggest chidush. So the first question, first question that I already got before the shul, which we'll answer it now, is if somebody is in the process of converting, uh, should they use what they chose to be their Hebrew name while they're in the process of converting? Especially if, let's say, for example, they're in a pro, you know, they need refuah lema. You know, so how we say we pray for somebody or we learn for somebody for the sake of refuah shlema, for their, for their health. Uh, so if, let's say, they're sick, chas v'shalom, they're sick, and they want somebody to uh, pray for them, uh, which name should they give them? Should they give them Jose, that they were born with, or should they give them Avram, that they want to be once they complete the conversion? Now, the answer is, this is actually a fantastic question that may elaborate into a shoe by itself, believe it or not. This is actually something I've been thinking about for a while, just never knew when to bring it. Amash Basyat Dishmaya gave me this question. It's like a it's like a they call it in baseball. You lobbed the ball to me. What is this question? Why was this why is so serious about this question? Is that first and foremost to answer the question is while a person is converting, it doesn't matter if they're a child or they're an adult, or it's a male, or it's a female, or I know you, or I don't know you or your rabbi is big, or your rabbi is small, or he's skinny, or he's fat like me, it'll make a difference. While a person is converting, while he's converting, meaning until one second, one second, one second before the mikveh. Once he's in the mikveh, different person. Until one second before the mikveh, he's 100% a goy. She is 100% goya. Meaning, that the Avraham that you want to be once you're converting and the Sarah that you plan to be to the converting is not related to you. You can call yourself whatever you want. Call yourself Pikachu. Call yourself uh, Hulk. Maybe turn green if somebody makes you upset after you watch this show. But in reality, it doesn't make a difference. Why? Until a person converts, he's 100% a non-Jew. Now, the deen is even more complicated with men than it is with women because men actually have a uh, brit milah. Have a brit milah before the mikveh. And uh, some have a machloket where they say, well, listen, maybe the conversion... So, when a, uh, when a man wants to convert... He has to, many times, not all the time, he has to get a Brit Milah. Uh, usually it's very, you know, it's a, even a person that got circumcised when they were a boy, when they were a little kid, uh, but it wasn't by a uh, Mohel. Then the Brit Milah that they got, 
usually is not uh, is not a kosher brit milah. There's a certain part of the uh, male member that was not cut. So anyone that uh, had that and then had a second brit milah knows exactly what I'm talking about and is cringing right now, saying, oh, why? Because the second brit milah hurts a lot more than the first. Hurts a lot more than the first. I don't remember. I was eight days old, but other people tell me. My memory goes back to three, not to eight days. So anyway, the, uh, so there's a machloket, there's a machloket of does he become a Jew at the moment he has a Brit Milah or not, in the Gemara, uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a very difficult issue. But in general, it's a, uh, at the time of the, um, the time of the Shulchan Aruch, and even before that, uh, some actually had the deen, somebody, some had the uh, opinion uh, that uh, or the psak that a person should convert the same day they have a brit milah, meaning the same day they dip into the mikveh. Problem is that it's painful to dip in the mikveh after just had a brit milah. So usually they give the person a month to recover. Uh, anyway, the uh, the issue is is this: no one actually cares what name a person picked. You want to be Avram, you want to be Yaakov, you want to be Moshe, you want to be whatever you want to be. It doesn't make a difference to anybody. You could pick some people, in, uh, you know, that are not Jewish, uh, have many names. I remember when I was a kid, you know, some kids in my class would have three, four, five names. Like they have, you know, two middle names, two last names, you know, and the first name is like Anne-Marie. Anne-Marie, uh, Samantha Tzvi, uh, Smith Williams. Shtabach Shimo, like it's a, it's a book, you need to know. How to win a spelling uh, spelling bee just to be able to remember this person's name, you know? But uh, she decided that you, she wants to be called Susie. It had nothing to do with anything. So people have a lot of names. Why? Because for the goyim, names mean nothing. Names mean absolutely nothing. Fam Yisrael means a lot. Fam Yisrael name means a lot. It has connection to the mazal of the person. Uh, has connection to the life of the person. That's why it's always. A um, advisable, highly, highly advisable by the Chachamim that if you're going to have a long name, you should think about it twice. Why? Because you need to make sure that anytime you tell somebody your name or somebody calls you, they should call you by your full name. Like if your name is Daniel, don't tell people to call you Dan. If your name is Daniel Moshe, don't tell people to call you Daniel. You have to be called Daniel Moshe. Why? Because if people call you by a shorter name, Hashem some of the Mekubalim say it could shorten your life. It could shorten your life. So this is a very dangerous thing. So a person that decides that uh, he or she wants to give themselves multiple names, you know, they like Avraham, they like Yitzhak, they like Yaakov, Moshe, David, Ve'aron, and, the, and, the, and, and the Shlomo maybe also. So they decide, oh, I'm going to be Avraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, Moshe, Aaron, and uh, David, and sometimes Shlomo. They're going to put the whole name on the card. But when you call, it's like, hey, what's up, Steve? What, Steve? What happened to Steve? No, that's my Hebrew name. See, there's no such thing as my Hebrew name. There's no such thing as, that's your name. You go up to Shemaim, go up to Shemaim, they're going to say, oh, Steve, what's up, Steve? They're not going to say Steve. They're going to call you by your name. One of the uh, women that um, publicized her story about a near-death experience, she went up to Shemaim. She was actually a religious woman. And uh, she uh, had a near-death experience to uh, pregnancy, died, went up to Shemaim. They uh, gave her a deen. Uh, they told her that, uh, that's it, your time is up. She says, no, no, I have kids. She goes, who are your kids? They ask in Shemaim, who are your kids? She goes, uh, Kobe. She goes, sorry, we don't have a Kobe. She goes, Dudu. Sorry, we don't have a Dudu. You don't have a Kobe? You don't have a Dudu? No. Uh, uh, Danny. Sorry, ma'am. There's no Danny here. It's not, it's not your kids. You don't have kids, Danny, Dudu, Cookie, Pookie. It's none, of, it's none of those names, those monkey names, they don't work in Shemaim. David, oh, David we have. David we have. Yaakov, oh, Yaakov, yeah, Yaakov we have. Daniel we have. Oh, the, the real names we have. In Shemaim, they don't call you monkey names. They don't have that. They don't, you know, it's, it's in, uh, in some parts of the world, you throw a coin into a pot, and you never anything. Oh, name, oh, Smith. Why? Because their names don't mean anything. In Ami Saif, Ami Saif means names mean a lot. But that's only once you become part of Ami Israel. Before you become part of Ami Israel, it doesn't make a difference what your name is. 
I know one guy, I sent him a Kiruv package because his name is, he went to school with me. He went to school with me. His name was John Cohen. So I figured that John is Jewish. Why? His name is Cohen. I don't know, I was naive. This is five years ago. I sent him a Kiruv package. I know him from high school, 20-something years ago. I sent him a Kiruv package in Arizona somewhere. And uh, John uh, sends me a message on Facebook. He goes, hey, listen, uh, thanks a lot for the package, but why'd you send it to me? I said, well, it's Torah. He goes, what, what, what's it to me? I said, aren't you Jewish? He goes, no. I said, but your name's Cohen. He goes, so? My name is Cohen, so? Some people are called Cohen. It means nothing. It means not, doesn't mean you're, uh, uh, you're actually a Cohen or you're even a Jew. Because of the intermarriage, the assimilation in the world over centuries, over the last two millennia, unfortunately, we cannot rely on names. So... Your name doesn't necessarily mean very much when you're not part of Klal Yisrael. When you are part of Klal Yisrael, it means an enormous amount. So it's highly, highly advisable for a person to eliminate the thought of, oh no, this is my Hebrew name, but I use such and such name. It's a mistake. It's a mistake. You should only use your Hebrew name. You shouldn't use your English name. There's no such thing in Shemaim. Now, of course, you got people used to it. You're already on Wall Street for 20 years. People know you as Johnny, and in reality, you're Moshe. And you're not using when you start telling people uh, that you're Moshe all of a sudden, it's going to be a little difficult. Okay, so over there, you're not able to do it. Fine, start somewhere else at your family, your gatherings, Chagim, Bet Knesset. Well, your community at the very least should know you as Moshe, should at least know you by your Hebrew name. You yourself should refer yourself to yourself as your Hebrew name. Why? Because that's your real name. But this means that you're part of Am Israel. Again, we go back to the same issue. The issue is that if a person is not part of Am Yisrael, his name is relatively meaningless. So when a person is going through a process of converting, and he decides to call himself Avraham, he decides to call himself uh, whatever he wants to call himself, and uh, he can call himself, it's, no, it's not a sin. You call yourself whatever you want. Like I said, you call yourself Pikachu. Be a Pokemon for a week. Whatever you want. There's no problem with that. Problem is that if you want somebody to pray for you, says, hey, listen, uh, Rabbi, do me a favor, pray for me. Oh, well, what's your name? Oh, I am uh, Avram ben Avram. Oh, the Ger Tzedek from Vilna Gaon time? Oh, Ishtabach Shimon. Wow, what a name you picked for yourself. What a name you picked for yourself. So we're praying for Avram ben Avram. Avram ben Avram is in Shemaim already. He goes, why are you praying for me? I'm already over here. No, no, I'm praying for the one over here. He goes, we don't have somebody in the system named Avram ben Avram in this generation. We don't have. No, he's the guy, he comes to the shiul, he gives staka every week, at least three, four hundred dollars, nice tzaddik. Because there's no such thing. The guy that's giving you three, the guy that's giving staka, he's not Avraham ben Avraham. Who is he? He's Jose uh, ben Emmanuel. What? Well, he's Avraham. No, 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 he's Jose. He's Jose. Until he converts, he's Jose. Why? Why in Shemaim care, they care so much? Because they know a lot more in Shemaim, they know a lot more than we could ever know. They know a lot more than we could ever know, and we're never going to know until we have experience. And one of the things that I learned over the last five or six years of doing this is that a person that's in the process of converting should be as uncomfortable as possible. Again, a person that's in the process of converting should be as uncomfortable as possible with the process of converting. It should not be a deluxe, you know, type of, uh, oh, this is so nice. Everyone welcomes me. I'm in every house for Shabbat. They call me Avram ben Avram. They give me Aliyah. No, 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 my friend. That's not a good thing. Why? Because if a person feels extremely comfortable, he starts becoming this Avram that he's going to choose to be once he finishes converting. He starts wearing a tzitzit. He starts wearing a kippah. People ask him, so where, where, where are you from? He goes, I'm from Israel. He's already here. Yeah, what, Natanya? You don't guys know him from Natanya? He doesn't know where Natanya. He's never been Natanya, but he heard the rabbi. He's from Natanya. So he's from Natanya also. And he starts living this life that uh, he likes. He loves it, actually. He learns Torah. He comes to the show. Everything is wonderful. Why is this a problem? Technically, this is what we want him to do. Technically, this is what we actually what we want him to learn. We want him to come to the Torah. We want him to, to learn. We wanted to come to Shuta. We wanted to come to, to the Shabbat, to the Rebbitzin's house, to the community. We want him to do all of those things. But we don't want him to be comfortable. Why? Because once a person, I know this from experience, once a person is comfortable, guess what? They don't convert. Once a person becomes too comfortable with the 
this other person they've become they don't end up converting why because they don't have the fire anymore to convert in the beginning when they were trying to become Avram when she was trying to become Sarah they had fire I'll do anything I'll do anything I'll move I'll change I'll do this I'll do whatever I want I want to be part of Am Yisrael okay fine no problem I'll help you Here's an email, here's a text message, here's this, here's that, come to the house, come to the this, come to that. You do all the things. Okay, now you still have to go through the conversion process. You have to meet the Bedin. You have to go through the whole nightmare, politics, but you have to do it. But now you moved, and you got comfortable, and you became friends with everybody, and everybody likes you, especially since you're new. No one has seen Atchinam against you yet. You know, some of the girls like you. Like, yeah, yeah, I'm gonna marry him. He's 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 not from that guy. He's a chidush. He's the chidush for the community. He's the chidush. I'm gonna marry that guy. Can't wait for him to finish. What? A, guess what? She can't wait so much. She starts dating him now. She can't wait so much. Come on, the rabbi loves him. He gives him aliyah sometimes. The rabbi loves him. He gives him a kavod and a shiur. He goes, oh, you see, Abraham came to the shiur. See, you guys should be like Avram. Why? Because Avram is always an issue. He's always an issue, Avram. Everybody else, all the real Avrams, they don't come to the issue. But Avram comes to the issue. Avram and Avram comes to the issue. Why? He has no yet yet. He has no yet He comes to the issue early. He's like, Rabbi, I'm here since uh, 3 o'clock. Yeah, but the issue starts at 9. Yeah, I figured maybe, maybe one day you're going to come early. He's here since 3 o'clock. He has nothing else to do. He's in the issue at 3 o'clock. Why? Because he wants, he has no yet But that's the problem. The problem is that he got comfortable, the community got comfortable, and we start assimilating, and the reality is that once the, once the tides turn, and now the Betin says, okay, we see you're in a community for six months, we see you're in a community for a year, we see you're in a community for a year and a half, two years, whatever it is, whatever Betin you're using has different timetables. We see you've been here for a couple of years, we like you, we're ready to move forward to the next step. We're going to test your knowledge. We're going to test what you're, you know, all the things that you've done with your life. Have you moved? Have you changed? Are you really watching this? Are you really watching? We want to test you. Meaning you're in the last stretch. You're in the last, let's say, six-month stretch. And now they say, listen, uh, by the way, make the check payable to uh, Bed Dean and Associates. Whoa. I have to pay for this? Until now, it was free. Until now, it was Avram for free. Now you want me to pay to be Avram? I'm already Avram. I don't need you. Until now, no one tested me for anything. I came to the shiul, I knew better than everybody else. Now you going to test me? Why, are you questioning my knowledge? I'm Avram and Avram. I'm in the shiul since 3 o'clock. All of a sudden, the Yetzirah comes. The same Yetzirah you didn't have the whole time, he comes. All of a sudden, it's an ego issue. All of a sudden, he's like, you know what? Who needs to convert? Who needs to convert? Why do I need to convert? I'm already living this life. I'm already comfortable. Everybody knows me. Everybody likes me. I'm as Jew as I want to be. This last sentence that I said, I saw it live with my own eyes. Somebody made a comment recently. This person. This person that unfortunately looks more Jewish than all of us. He looks more Jewish than all of us. He has payers longer than all of us. He screams Rabbi Nachman, Rabbi higher than everybody. He starts mentioning words that Hasidim don't even know. You would think this guy is Ashkenazi from the previous Gilgul. But he's not even one percent Jewish. Not even one percent Jewish. Not even, not even a person of converting. Him and his other friend are tragedy. But the problem is, is that part of the fault is the community. And this is what we have to understand. A person that's in the process of converting, yes, we want you to learn. Yes, we want you to come to the shul. Yes, we want you to do all those things. But you should never get too comfortable. And think I'm finished. Think, no, no, I, I could already be this person. No, no, you have to put a fire under yourself that I, I'm going to get there. Don't already give yourself the trophy before you started the competition. That name that you are going to be, Bezat Hashem, that should be part of your trophy. It shouldn't be something you give yourself now just because you like the name. It should be the day you convert, the second you convert, no one should ever know your, your other name. Shouldn't tell them, oh no, it's really, I'm Avraham, but really I'm Jose. No, 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 shouldn't. You should actually change your name legally after you convert. 
Why? Because once you actually convert the Rambam Pusek La'alacha, you have no connection whatsoever to this other person. Zero. You are a brand new baby. You are a newborn. You are zero years old. Your previous birthday is irrelevant. It's a different person's birthday. You should never celebrate it. In fact, your parents are not technically considered your parents. According to the Torah, the rabbis don't allow it because it looks weird, but according to the Torah, if somebody converts and his mother converts also, they both convert, okay, they can actually technically marry each other, according to the Torah. Why? Because they're not, before they converted, they weren't allowed. Why? Because they were mother and son. After they converted, they both became two completely different people. They're not related. They're not related. They're allowed to actually marry each other. But we don't do The rabbis don't allow it. Why the sages don't allow it? It says because the goyim don't understand this concept. And they're going to say, look, what happened? This guy was a goy, he was a tzaddik, he became a Jew, he now has incest. Shem achem. What kind of religion is this? Because they don't understand, so the rabbi said, no, not allowed. But in reality, it's allowed. According to the Torah, according to Hashem, it's allowed. And in some cases, it was done. Why? Because the person moved to a different place where no one knew him. No one knew that it was his, uh, his mom. No one knew it was his mom. So no one knew that they were both converted and so on. Or no one knew she was uh, her father. And it was actually a dean that came to our, uh, to our uh, table one time, maybe about two years ago, a year and a half ago, that uh, a woman came and she said that uh, both her and her father converted. And uh, they had certain issues. I'm not going to go into the details, chas shalom, that no one understands who and what this is. But the point is, is that uh, sh- the girl through the shiurim that we have, she found out she's not allowed to live with our father anymore. Why? Because they both converted. She's 25 years old. Her father is, I don't know, maybe 30, now 40, 40 years old. So he, he had her when he was really young. And um, she has major, major issues with the world where it's going to be almost impossible for her to find a shiduch. Her father is not interested in anybody at all. Because he already had enough of a nightmare of women in his life for one lifetime. So he said, what do we do? We're not allowed to live together, but I can't afford to live by myself. He can't afford to live by himself. What do we do? So I actually brought this to a Dayan. A Dayan in Yerushalayim. They said, listen, tell them they're allowed to marry each other if they want. If nobody knows them, they're allowed to marry each other. Why? Because they're not related anymore. So this may sound disgusting to the Goy. This may sound disgusting even to the Jew who doesn't know what's, what does it mean, conversion. But according to Allah, once a person converts, he's 100% a different person. No relation whatsoever to their past. Real converts, whether they like it or not, see that happen through their own eyes. Where in the beginning, they still have a connection to their past. After a little while... They don't really look forward to seeing their old friends anymore and family anymore. But if they see them, they say hi. A little while longer passes, they hope they don't come anymore. A little while longer passes, they hope they don't even call. They change their phone number. They don't tell anybody. One day they run into them in a supermarket in a different city. Oh, you're still alive. I didn't know. Oh, yeah, I forgot to tell you. I changed my phone number three years ago. Sorry, here's a phone number. You know, I forgot it. I'll call you. I'll call you. (laughs) And you hope that another six years pass before you talk to them again. Why? Because you have no connection to this person. They come to your house one time, you feel like it's a stranger. It's like, oh. Yeah, it's my brother. Technically, he's my brother, but it's like a stranger. I kind of I hope that the gardener comes. The gardener, I like the gardener better than this brother of mine. Why? This guy's a stranger. The real converts, they little by little, their neshama starts suffering by seeing its past. That's also why you're not allowed, according to Allah, you're not allowed to remind a convert that he's a convert or that she's a convert. Just like you're not allowed to remind a uh, Baal Tshuva that they're a convert or, or uh, that, uh, that they're a Baal Tshuva. So, on, unless it's for toilet, unless it's for, it's for, for a useful purpose, but in general you should refrain from doing so, even the following generation. For 10 generations, you're not supposed to. So now, Rabotai Karim, when a person starts to go through the conversion process because they first, they decided that the Torah is emit, then they decided to start taking action, they start learning, they start doing, they maybe hopefully eventually find a real rabbi that's going to help them, 
and little by little they go through the process, but they start taking initiative on certain things, and they start feeling comfortable as this Jew that's not really a Jew. This can become a major, major stumbling block spiritually for their conversion, and many people that want to go through conversion end up not going through conversion because of this. Number one, they start seeing that the politics and the money and all the other stuff that's involved with conversion is so annoying. They feel like, why should I do this? I already live as a Jew for two years, three years, five years. Some people tell me, oh yeah, I've been converting already for 12 years. Somebody sent me a text message today. He goes, yeah, I've been doing everything on my own since 2003. You're a Jew for longer than me. Like, well, what's going on? Why, what? I've, been doing things, I've been doing things since I was 2003. I've been a Jew, but I haven't officially converted. Something's wrong with that. That means in Shemaim, they don't want you to convert. That's what it means. Why? Your desire is good, but your deeds aren't. That's what the Malach said to the Kuzari. The Kuzari and king that eventually converted himself and converted his entire people. So, if you see that you're hitting major stumbling blocks, you have to check yourself. What am I doing wrong? But a lot of people that feel too comfortable, that's what they're doing wrong. Because they start seeing, oh, the bed dean is going to charge $2,000? Nah. Let me, uh, let me save up for this. Let me save up for this. Before they start the journey, they won't take a loan out. They won't to rob a bank if they could. But after they feel like they're a Jew already for two, three years, they're like, nah, it's expensive. Let me look for a cheaper bed dean. Let me see if I can negotiate. Let me see until I uh, do this and I do that. All of a sudden... They're not as on fire to convert. Why? The money all of a sudden became an issue. I can tell you the difference between a real convert and a fake one. I had a few, Bo Hashem, that have ca- crossed our path, and Bo Hashem, we had the merit to convert. I had a couple of people that between the two of them, they had nothing. Look, if you add the zero of one side and the zero on the other side, they had absolutely nothing. But when it came to converting, they came up with the money. Why? Because they wanted to become Jewish. They become one, become Jewish. One family, another family, Shtabach, Shimo, everybody came up with the money. How? They borrowed money from people. Mamash, $500 from here, $500 from there, $1,000, 1000 whatever. We have to go here, we have to go, whatever they have to do, then pay me. I don't get a penny, penny from it. They have to pay the bedin, they have to pay the flight, they have to pay a hotel, whatever it is. All the different things that have to do with it, they had to come up with the money. They came up with it, but they had nothing. But they came up with the money. Why? Because they wanted to convert. Other people, they have a job, they make a few dollars every month. But every time you tell them, listen, by the way, you have to send the bedin, uh, the, the, the check. You have to uh, buy tefillin. You have to buy talit. You have to uh, brit milah. You have to do all that stuff. costs money. And people don't work for free. It's not Christianity that people donate, uh, you know, every penny that they have. You know, here in Judaism, people don't donate. So we have to pay for stuff. So the reality is, what happens is that people have to pay for stuff and nobody wants to pay. So the guy all of a sudden says, no, no, I don't have any money. What do you mean you don't have any money? You work for Google. Doesn't, Google doesn't pay your paycheck. You work for UPS. UPS doesn't pay your paycheck. You work for the uh, pizza shop. Pizza shop where you work for free for the pizza. If you're such a bad chesed, you work. You serve pizza for free. How come you don't have any money? It's not they don't have any money. They don't have any desire. Why? Because they became too comfortable. Became too comfortable as a so-called convert. So this is a very very dangerous situation. And a lot of people have made this mistake by starting to live this life too much. And they start referring to themselves in this other name. They start wearing certain clothes. They start acting certain ways. And in essence, they forget that they're still in the process. And they forget themselves. And I just have a story, mamash, mamash, hot off the press. Hot off the press three days ago. Three days ago, I find out one student of mine... He's in a conversion process. He's mamash in the last four or five months. Four or five months, we're sending him to an honorable bedin. And Ishtabach Shimo, everything is good. He knows. He learned. He, mamash, mamash, I wish every convert would be so good. Until I find out he's been lying to me the whole time. What? He's dating a Jew. He decided that he wants to, he likes being a Jew so much, because he's been pretending to be a Jew for two years. He likes it so much, he decided that uh, he's going to tell, he's going to start dating a Jewish woman. So he's dating a Jewish woman right now. 
What's the problem? The problem is that if the bed dean finds out, not only are they not going to convert him, they'll never convert him, ever. They'll put him on cherem. Why? Because you're a liar. It's not a matter of that intermarriage and problems of that kind are everywhere, unfortunately. But you're a liar. You turn into a liar. Once you're a liar, we can't take your word. You're no agun. So, but why did this happen? He became too comfortable. He became too comfortable with his life. So we have to contain ourselves. So my, my advice for people that are going through the conversion process, if you are not in a relationship, don't start one. Not with a Jew and not with a non-Jew. If you plan on converting, just press the red button, please. If you plan on converting and you're not in a relationship, don't start one. If you plan on converting. If you start one, kiss your conversion goodbye 99% of the time. Even if the other person says, oh, I want to convert too, kiss that conversion goodbye. Why? It doesn't work that way. Life doesn't work that way. If you are in a relationship, unless your partner, unless your spouse is on the same page as you, meaning they're just as excited about converting as you are, don't even bother starting. Why? You have to get on the first page, for, on the same page first and fix your relationship first. Before you start deciding to take this huge, monstrous journey together. Third thing is, always remember and always remind yourself you're in the process. You're not finished until you're finished. You're not finished until you're finished. So don't start feeling overly comfortable because that will kill the fire that you need in order to survive the conversion process today. It's not an easy process. Next part is when it comes to money, when it comes to certain things as far as moving, expenses, things of that nature, these are not battles for you to fight. If you have to come up with the money, come up with it. Why? It's the way the, work, the world works. The bet dean will not change the price for you. The community will not lower the house prices for you. Tefillin are not getting any cheaper than they already are. Mezuzot are not an optional thing. You must have them. All of these different things are a must-do, must-haves for a Jew. If you already have a problem with all of this before you became a Jew, don't become a Jew. Why? It's expensive to be a Jew. They're going to say to me, wait a minute, uh, I, what, you have to be a millionaire to be a Jew? No, there's plenty of Jews that are broke. But Hashem provides for those specific things. Hashem provides for those specific things. But the people that say, no, no, what, I have to move in order to convert. I, yes, you have to move in order to convert. If you don't move in order to convert, then, don't, then you're not going to convert. Why? Because you cannot be a Jew by yourself. So all of the people that fight against the, uh, the, the tide and they try to say, no, maybe I should try something else. Maybe I could try to go to Rabbanut in Israel and you know, convince them to, to convert me and then I'll go back to uh, Arkansas where my next door neighbor is 37 miles away. You know, maybe I could do that. Yes, you can do that, but then you'll be a sinner for the rest of your life. Why do that? You don't know how to be a Jew yet. Most Jews don't know how to be Jews. The rabbis need to learn how to be Jews sometimes. Because why? Because you need to learn. Every year you have to learn for the holidays all over again. Even though you've already learned it 37 times. You have to learn again. You have to learn again. You have to learn again. And they are already experts. They were born into the system. You, brand new, again, already know better than them. So, there are certain battles that are not worth fighting. Money, politics, all of those things, don't bother fighting them. Either play along Pick a different game. All the people that try to fight it and try to make videos against it and try to make their own thing and try to do their own deals, all they do is become just one of, if they end up converting, they end up becoming these mean, nasty, disgusting people that we pray for them to, that, uh, that they, they should have never converted. It's a lot of nasty people. They become the, what the Gemara says is like a skin disease for Am Yisrael. Or they just never convert because no one wants to tolerate them. No one wants to tolerate them. People think, I have, I have this one kid from uh, uh, somewhere in Europe, some one of, the, uh, one of these countries in Europe. He calls me and uh, he starts like yelling at me. He starts yelling at me like as if I work for him. No, you need to convert me. He did it. Click. I don't need to do anything. 
His friend calls me 500 times. I know his friend. He's from, uh, from the UK. Nice guy. Actually has manners. He's like, no, I'm sorry. He's just this. I'm like, he has to find somebody else. I don't work for anybody. I work for Hashem. I work for Hashem. You call, yell at me? Why? Why would I, Who died in me? Who died and gave me this dean? Why, why do I have to get you? Why are you going to yell at me? People don't understand. They fight, they, fight against, they fight against their friends. I'm the only friend you had. Now you lost that. So the question is a, is a huge question. We can talk about this for the rest of the week. Because there's so many problems with converts. I'm seeing it. I'm seeing it. A lot of converts, they kill themselves with this. They make mistakes that are, they seem so small, but they end up being so big. Most, of the, most often, it's because they become too comfortable, either because of themselves or because of their communities or whatever the case may be. And what ends up happening is that they forget that they're going through a conversion process. Now, I know it's not comfortable for somebody that's already doing it for two years to constantly be reminded that they're still not finished. But it's necessary. It's necessary for you to constantly be reminded. Why? Because you need to hate it. You need to hate the current position because that's the fire you need to cross the line, to cross the finish line. You need it. Why? Because it's hard. It's hard. Last but not least, I tell this to every single person that I help, like hands-on, convert. Expect problems. A lot of them. Like serious problems. Like problems you never even imagined could be a problem in your life. Right before the conversion. The whole conversion, let's say you're going through it for, let's say, two years, or one year, or five, whatever it is. It doesn't make a difference. You could be going through a smooth process. You could feel like Hashem is holding you like a little baby. You say, kuchi kuchi ku, kuchi kuchi ku, and everything is cute. And it's like, oh, Abba, oh, hey. everything is great for two years. Everything for two years, they go, kuchi kuchi ku, Abba, it's so much fun. It's so great. All of a sudden, pah! What happened? Sure, sure. Car's flat, car's broken, house on fire, divorce, kids are kidding. Everything goes wrong. What happened? I said, could you go for a little while? Now you're getting, now, and now it's the real test. What happened? Right before conversion, if you don't start seeing ghosts, it's a miracle. I'm, t- I'm not joking. This is actually not an exaggeration. You start seeing stuff. You start seeing stuff. I have students that start seeing stuff. I'm not joking. It's funny, but it's not a joke. But wait, I start have students that start seeing stuff, and they're not crazy. They're not crazy. I'm not talking about one student, two, three, four, five. I'm talking about a bunch. They start seeing stuff. Why? Because the Yetzirah doesn't want to release the prisoner. And you just got too close. You got too close, all the alarms. Do, do, do. All the alarms are off. In the beginning, no one cared. Oh, yeah, yeah, he's cute with the little titit. He's cute with his little keeper pretending. No one cares. Yetzirah doesn't care. Why? It's, ah, it's the first six months. Who cares about this guy? Oh, trees grow for free. Beards grow for free. Big deal. He grew a beard. Well, so what? He grew a beard. So what? She has kisui while well, she looks Jewish. So what? It means nothing. But now you got a date from the bed dean. The bed dean calls. Hey, hey, sir. Yes, come on March 15th at 8.30 a.m. You actually have a date. It's in two months from now. Three months from now? Expect problems. I'm not wishing bad. I'm telling you a reality. I'm telling you a reality. Every case is like this. Why? The way it works. You cannot join Am Israel without Mesirut Nefesh. And many people break. Many people break before. Why? Because it's a lot. It's a lot to take. It's a lot to take. But the ones that make it, they're the best Jews there is. The fake Jews never have a problem. The fake converts, they never have a problem. Even uh, the scoochie coochie coo, even at the Betin. Why? Because it's all fake anyway. Yet Sarah is like, yeah, yeah, let them, let them, let them convert, let them convert. Why? Because she's really not Jewish, so all the kids are going to come out and not Jewish, and it's going to create a big problem. So, this Rabotai is a huge, huge issue today that, uh, as funny and as humorous as we try to make it, is actually a tragedy. It's a tragedy. And part of it is actually our fault. It's our fault because we make certain people so comfortable, we let them in without actually reminding ourselves. Forget about reminding them. Reminding ourselves, it's not yet. 
It's not yet. There are certain schools. There are certain schools that it's already policy. It's not like a one-off. Every school has a one-off something. Every school. Every school has a one-off. I remember when I was a kid, every, every class, every grade that I was in, there was always like one kid that was like off for something. One kid was like just landed from Pakistan, but there was no passport. We don't know who he is really, but he's in school. He's sitting right next to me. Cute kid, nice kid, but I'm just not sure if he's a terrorist or not. Not really sure. Another, another grade, there's a kid. He looks like he's 37 years old, but the rest of us are 12. He looks like he's 37. He has a beard, but he's like a little off. He has a beard. We're not really sure. Every class had something. Every class had something. In every school, there's something. In every school, there's like a certain policy. It's like a one-off exception because such and such happened. But, unfortunately, today, I'm finding out more and more that there are certain schools that their tuition, Jewish schools, yeshiva, the tuition is so high. We're talking about twenty-five, thirty, forty thousand dollars a year. And some even more. 33,000. 33, 33,000 to send a little kid. 33, in my generation, $33,000, you're going to Harvard. Today, maybe you're a waiter at Harvard for $33,000. $33,000 to send a 9, 10, 11 year old kid to school. What are they doing? Feeding him gold? Now, why is this a problem? Why? Because now, if you have a family that wants to convert, but they're not converted yet. And they have three kids. They have three little cute kids. They have Emily at seven years old, uh, Dudu at uh, nine years old. He's not really Dudu, he's really Jose, but he chose Dudu because Dudu sounds more Jewish. And Avram, and Avram is 11 years old. Okay, really, he's like, uh, you know, William. He's not Avram, but uh, he's Avram, and Avram for the school. And they say, I want to take him to the yeshiva. So they come to the yeshiva, hi yeshiva, yeah, we're taking our school, we're in the process of converting, yeah, Rabbi Satan Shad is converting us, when's the conversion day? We don't know yet. Okay. Now the Rosh Yeshiva has a decision to make. Why? He just missed payroll. Why? Payroll is tough. Why? I mean, payroll, you have all these teachers to pay. It's tough, it's a lot of money. The cleaning people, it's tough, yeah, it's a lot of money. The food, it's a lot of money, right? He has $100,000 staring at him right now. Three students, $33,000 each. You got $99,000. You have a $100,000 decision to make right now. Do you let them in or not? Unfortunately, today, it's not a one-off situation. Today, it's policy. You let them in. You let them in. Why is this a problem? If they were all six, seven-year-olds, it's not exactly a tragedy. It's not good. It's not a tragedy. What's a tragedy? When it gets to high school age, when it gets to 13, 14 years old. Why? Because now, Sarah, the Jewish girl, okay, and, and, and Chava, the Jewish girl, they like Jose. They like Jose. Why? But he's, he's Avram ben Avram, though. But they like him, he's Jose. But, he's, but, but to them, he's Avram ben Avram. And what happens? They start a relationship. And you have a problem. You have intermarriage inside a Jewish school. You have intermarriage inside a Jewish school. It's even worse if the girl is, uh, is, is from somewhere else. If the girl is from somewhere else, if the girl is from, let's say, somewhere in Haiti, she's from somewhere in Europe, she's from Russia, she's somewhere, she's not Jewish at all, but she wants to convert. When her mom is finished, she wants to convert too. Now, Avram, the real Avram, he, well, he likes her. But she doesn't end up converting. And you have a problem. You have a very serious problem here on your hands. If there was, was a one-off then I wouldn't talk about it. Why? Because we don't talk about one-offs. We don't talk about that. But unfortunately, what I'm finding out, especially the last couple of months, is that it's become policy to accept converts in the process to schools, to Jewish schools at all ages, to such an extent that right now, right now as we speak, there's one school that over 50% of the kids are Muslim. Right now, right now I'm talking about, right now I know of a school for sure, 100%. I think the statistic came out, it was something like 62%. 62% of the kids are Muslim. No, it's a Muslim school. Yeah, it's a Jewish school. It's a Muslim school, but it's a Jewish school. They call themselves yeshiva. You see all the Muslim kids say modeani. 
He's seeing all the Jewish kids say, Modeani lefanecha. What Modeani? You're going to kill the, your teacher in a few years. What Modeani? 62% of the kids are Muslim. Why? Don't pay tuition cash. Cash. Don't have to deal with checks. Why? No, you got Shamayim Rabotai. We're not going to survive. This is, this is not one school. This is not two schools. This is not three schools. It's policy. I spoke to a woman just a few days ago about this same subject. Excuse me. And I told her that before you send your kids to school today, you have to ask them a question face to face. You can't ask it on the phone. Why? Because if you ask it on the phone, you may not get the honest answer. You have to go to the school and you have to ask them, do you, ex- do you accept non-Jews in your school? Including converts in the process. If they say yes, you shouldn't send your kids there. Not that we are. I love converts more than anybody else in the world. But I don't want my kids going to school with them. Why? Until they're Jews, I don't want my kids going to school with them. It's too risky. What if he doesn't convert? What if it doesn't work out? What if, he, what if she doesn't convert? What if she doesn't convert? It's too risky. It's too risky. I'm not, I don't want my kid to be in that same school, bottom line. And I'm saying it openly, and you could send me as much hate mail as you want. Throw tomatoes and potatoes. But by the way, no one loves commerce more than me. I just know the risks. I know the risks. The reality is something will happen. A few cases are going to happen. One, two, three, four, five families are not going to convert in the end because of money, because of politics, because something is going to happen. And what's going to happen? Avram is already in love with Samantha. Yeah, but uh, Samantha's not Jewish. Yeah, but she looks Jewish. She's been to Jewish school with me. Well, what's the problem? Ah, you should have thought about that before you accepted our $33,000. So we're mamas breeding into marriage because of money, because of nonsense. So this is a problem. So anyone that's looking to be a real Jew, looking to convert, please, if you really love Hashem, don't put yourself or his children in danger. Be patient. You don't want to go to public schools? I don't blame you. I wouldn't even send a dog to a public school today. A dog I wouldn't send to a public school today. It's dangerous. 50-50% whether you make it. You want to homeschool the kid? Homeschool the kid. No problem. But don't send him to a Jewish school. Why? Something may go wrong. And then you have intermarriage on your hands. And whether you're a Jew or you're a Noahide, you're definitely not righteous with intermarriage. The Jew is judged as someone that's, if he's intermarried, that's karet. The Noahide that's intermarried is karet. Meaning, neither one of them have ulam abai. doesn't make a difference. You're a nice person, not a nice person. doesn't make a difference. So if you really are converting for the right reasons, you should not go to a Jewish school. If you're already in one, you should speak to your rabbi and see what's going on. Because it seems like some schools look like they're Jewish, but they're not really Jewish, so there's really no risk there. Some call themselves Jewish, but they're not really Jewish schools. So it all depends on what it is. But I can tell you in general, the most important part for converts that wants to really convert is don't feel comfortable. You're not supposed to be comfortable. You're supposed to be under pressure. It's supposed to be a process that you should do everything possible to expedite it and if you get too comfortable you're not going to expedite it you're going to take as long as you want you're going to breeze through certain things you're going to delay certain things you're going to postpone certain things and before you know it Mashiach is going to come and you're still not going to convert why because you just took too long took too long you lost the merit in Shemaim and they won't want you to convert any more questions yes They're not. We convert. We 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 can we consider somebody a convert. You know, for for uh, as far as that's a real convert of somebody already converted. But in reality, is that once somebody is actually a convert, he's considered a hundred percent Jew, or you know, a Jewish woman or a Jewish man. They're not considered a, a converted Jew. They're just considered a Jew. So someone that's a convert is meaning that they're they're in the process. They're in the process. But many people are in the process. 
in perpetuity. For, you know, they're, they're in the process forever because something's wrong. Either there's a fake rabbi or a fake uh, convert or fake something. Something's wrong. Um, conversion is not supposed to be easy, but it's also not supposed to be impossible. Many people put their own stumbling block in front of themselves because they do something wrong and in heaven they say, I don't want this person to convert. And I've seen it time and time again where with the com- when it comes to men, usually the reasons why many of them have problems is not because of money like people think. It's because of arayot, because of sex crimes. Either with a wife, a girlfriend, uh, themselves, whatever it is, they're doing something that is considered 100% illegal in Shemaim. And Hashem will put every obstacle in front of them to make sure they don't convert. With women, it's sometimes the same thing, sometimes otherwise. But the point is, is that anyone that converts, you should ask them for a bacha. Why? That person overcame something extraordinary that not many people succeed in doing. Anyone that doesn't convert, you shouldn't necessarily feel too bad for them. Why? There's a reason. There's a reason why that happened. I'm not saying celebrate, but you don't say, oh, poor guys. Or what poor guy? I mean, in Shemaim, they didn't want him to convert. In Shemaim, they don't want to convert. It's a, that's the reality. I have one guy who tells me, oh, I've been going through the conversion process for 11 years. As soon as he finished saying that, I already knew why he's going through the process of conversion for 11 years. You know why? Because every single thing that I say, he always he's the one guy that constantly says, yeah, but what if this? But what if that? But what if this? Are you sure about this? But what if this? Meaning he has no emunat chachamim. He doesn't want to listen to the rabbi. He doesn't want to listen to him. He wants to listen to himself. So I say, Bezal Hashem, it's going to be another 11 years. Bezal Hashem, it's going to be another 11 years. Bezal Hashem, you never convert. Why? Am Yisrael doesn't need you. doesn't need people. We already have enough problems as it is. We already have enough problems as it is. We need another problem. Bezal Hashem, it's going to be 100 years. You never can. Why? You're a problem. You're a problem person. So this is, these are the things that we need to know. Again, we want people to convert. We want people to join Am Yisrael. It's actually a big, big uh, chesed from Hashem to allow certain people to join us. But not everybody. Not everybody. Next question. He could choose a name the first day. You just shouldn't use the name until he converts. Them? The second they dip in a mikveh. The second they dip in a mikveh, the person gets out of the, uh, before he goes into the mikveh, he already has to decide what the name is. When he comes out of the mikveh, they ask him, what's your name? They ask him, what is, you know, you have to say a blessing. What, who are you? And then when the uh, Bedin makes the blessing, they use that name. They write on the, on the uh, conversion certificate, that name. They write that name. They also write the old name to know who, you know, for, for, for record per, uh, keeping purposes. But nonetheless, from that moment on, that person came, went into the mikveh, Jose, he came out of Ram. He came out of Ram, he's forever going to be Avram, even if he doesn't want to be Avram anymore. He can never undo it. He can never ever undo it. She can never undo it. She can never go back to being Samantha. She became Sarah, she's Sarah forever. Well, she could be a bad Sarah, but she's never going to be a bad, a bad Samantha. Why? Samantha died. She's gone. She's gone forever. She can never be back. Well, they're, if they're in the process of conversion and they got to the Bedin, they should know that by then. But uh, yes, that, but you, tell them, you tell them that also. Yeah, you tell them at the Bedin. Yes, we tell them at the Bedin. We tell them a lot of things at the Bedin. We also tell them that, you know, last week, I remember Rabbi um, Eliyahu ben Chaim, he says this every time, same line. He says, you know, last week, you uh, drove a car on Shabbat. No problem. Next week, you drive a Shabbat, kill you. Moshe Rabbeinu, kill you. So he tells him. This is how he talks. He says, last week, you ate whatever you want. No problem. Next week, you eat chelev, Moshe Rabbeinu, kill you. So he tells him to the face. The people are like, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Kill you. Moshe Rabbeinu, kill somebody. And so he tells him, Moshe Rabbeinu, kill somebody. Okay, okay. That's like 98% of our population. That's what you have to do. That's what you have to do. You have to tell them. You have to tell them the truth. Why? If they don't know the basic minimum that it's death penalty, you can, that's not a real convert. Gemara says it. Gemara Masechet Abu Dazara. Gemara Masechet Abu Dazara says, What's a Tinok Shenishba? Oh, the famous Gemara. What's a Tinok Shenishba? Tinok Shenishba is a captured baby. 
a Jewish baby, the Goyim captured him, and they raised him as a Christian. He doesn't know he's a Jew. So that person, Hashem Yechem, he's not judging Shemaim as a Jew. Why? Uh, as a regular Jew. Why? He doesn't know he's a Jew. He doesn't know he's a Jew. So they say, okay, but what happens if the convert is like this? The so the Gemara says, how could a convert be like this? So go, oh, the convert, he converted, but he never officially moved out of his community, so he went back to his old ways. He says, what, the convert violated Shabbat? He's like, yeah. She goes, when did he start violating Shabbat? He says, right away. He says, oh, he never converted then. But yeah, but he went to Bedin. He goes, never converted. It means nothing. It means nothing. There's no such thing as a, uh, no, he's not Tinoch Shanishba. He says, he's not Tinoch Shanishba. There's no convert Shanishba. There's no convert Shanishba. He never converted. He's a faker from day one. He's a faker in Shemaim from day one. There's no convert from Shemaim. There's no convert in Shemaim. He never moved out of his community. You should have never allowed him to convert. He said, yeah, but what about Shabbat? He said, if you didn't teach him that violating Shabbat is death penalty, he's not a convert. Gemara says in Mephorash, you see in Gemara Masehad Abu Dazar, you see this? If you did not teach him that violating Shabbat is death penalty, then you did not teach him the basic minimum of being a Jew. Therefore, his conversion is not valid. It's not valid. Yeah, but he went to a big bad dean. Could be big dean, small dean, a lot of deans. They're gonna get a dean. He's not a he's not a Jew. A lot of people are gonna get a dean. He's not a Jew though. She's not a Jew. Why? He doesn't know the basic minimum of Judaism. That violating Shabbat is a death penalty. Next. Convert? No, the, uh, the the circumcision, if it's a uh, for a convert, is not a ceremonial thing because they are it's a surgery. If they're an adult, they have to do a circumcision. The the ceremony is that they wake up and hopefully get through the pain for the next few days. That's the best ceremony. Best part of the ceremony is when it's over. It's not like an eight year old baby that stops crying when you give him a little wine and he's drunk. You know, so he stops crying thirty seconds later. The, uh, the 35 year old is not stopping crying if you give him a little wine. He wants more. He wants three, four bottles. You give him some arak too. Give him some arak, give him some vodka, a few shots. Make sure, make sure it's, you have enough supply for the next three days so I could survive. Shem yachem. Shem yachem. I'm telling you, honestly, if I. Uh, Baruch Hashem, Hashem made me a Jew from birth. Why? You know why he made me a Jew from birth, right? Because he knows I wouldn't convert. He was. If I found out at 30 years old, I have to convert. No chance. Why? Brit Mila? You do Brit Mila. You do it. I see Mamash. I see students. They do Brit Mila. I, mamash, I respect them. I respect them. I respect people. I do Brit Mila. I respect. Women is easy to convert. Why? They just go to the pool. Shh. They go in the pool. Where they go? They go to Mikveh. That's it. Finish. That's the, that's the problem. Women, it's easy to convert them. It's the easiest thing. Easiest thing. No, I can't. Easiest thing in the world. Easy. Can, can, can convert them to the beach. So. It's a mikveh, but yeah, but there's, uh, you know, I'm not allowed to go there. Anyway, the, the, the thing is, though, is that you're right, but you're wrong. You're right, but you're wrong. You're right, you're allowed to go to the ocean, but there's, when there's no people, unfortunately, there's a lot of people in the, in the ocean. You could go at night. There's no conversion at night. Conversion is during the day. Conversion is during the day. Huh? Yeah, if you could find a place in the beach there's nobody there, yes, but uh, it's not a problem. Yeah. Problems, problems. <laughs> But anyway, the, uh, I see certain people, they, they, they do Brit Milah. I have a lot of respect for them. I have one guy. I told you guys about Bulgaria, right? He did the Brit Milah, he did the cure the same day. I have a different one. I have one guy, he gave a Brit Milah to himself. A guy, we met. A guy, I have, I have a guy, I have a guy who gave Brit Milah to him. As soon as he found out Christianity is nonsense and wanted to convert, he started reading Sefer Bereshit. To do, do, he got to Avraham Avinu. He got to Avraham Avinu. Avraham Avinu to Brit Milah. He goes, oh, that's what Hashem wants? He tells me. He goes, I found out that day Hashem wants Brit Milah. I started preparing. I'm going to give myself Brit Milah. Why? He went to the doctor. The doctor said it's, I don't know, three, four, five, six thousand dollars. He says, I don't have three dollars. He says, but that's what Hashem wants? He gave himself Brit Milah. Wow. Highly, highly not advisable, by the way. <laughs> highly not advisable. But he gave himself Brit Milah. So there are some people that mamash. I, I mean, I respect them for doing it, but it's not it's not advisable. You, so you could. Have from the yes, but it's not the same thing. It's not the same thing. Many times the brit milah that the goyim get is not kosher brit milah. They have to get a second brit milah. 
because a certain part of the of the member that the Jews take out that the goyim don't, so they have to get a second brit milah. Anyway, the point is that I see converts and I fall in love right away. Why? Because converts are special people. You just gave up your family, you gave up your community, you gave up everything you know to become part of Am Yisrael. But that's after the person converted. When a person's in the process, it's dangerous. Why is it dangerous? Because it's 50-50. It's 50-50. I saw some people that, Mamash, I thought these people are going to be such wonderful Jews I can't wait for them to convert. They never convert. I couldn't wait. I was, I, was, I was part of trying to teach them. Met with them, talked to them, set them up at different places, helped them move to a certain location. Whatever was needed to happen, Baruch Hashem, they never converted. Why? Always has to do with a girl or a guy or this or that. Somebody can control themselves and conversion's out the window. So, it's a uh, it's an issue. So as far as back to your question, if a uh, person that converts, there is no ceremony in regards to the Brit Milah because it's a surgery and he's sleeping. So even if they had a ceremony, only the rabbis will be celebrating and he's sleeping because <laughs> they're eating the cookies that he bought. <laughs> so that's not he's not going to enjoy that. Uh, then a month a month later, it takes him about a month to heal. Uh, it takes a month to heal or so. And then after a month, he goes to the uh, to the bedin, and the uh, the bedin uh, we ask him some questions. There's three rabbis, ask him some questions. Usually that process is very simple, a few minutes. Ask him some basic questions. As long as he doesn't start saying, "Oh, listen, I think we should all do tshuva, go back to Yeshu," or some nonsense like that. That uh, you know, some guy showed me a video the other day that some Israeli was telling people, "You should all do tshuva. You should believe in Yeshu." Mamash in Israel. An Israeli guy is telling people, you're all going to get for not believing in Jesus. Mamash, crazy. This is what we have today. Anyway, so unless he starts saying, you know, doesn't say, you know, stupid things like this, and he answers the questions like a normal human being, uh, they say, okay, you're ready. They check the breed. It's ready. Everything is good. He goes to the mikveh, and the rabbis go to the mikveh to watch him or her dip uh, and do a blessing beforehand. Once they dip once, the rabbis uh, and then comes out and they see it's a kosher dip. We leave, and then after that, he uh, you know could dip more. She could dip more. They could leave whatever they want. Usually, they stay for a little longer because they're nervous. And sometimes the rabbi asks them to speak while they're still swallowing water because they're not used to being in a mikveh, so they don't realize like even though it's technically a you know it's like a pool, but you're not really you're surprised that they're asking you to pray at the same time you're dipping. So a lot of people end up swallowing water. It's kind of sad, but it's true. It happens almost every time. You know, a person goes into the mikveh and says, Okay, say a blessing. So the water is still dripping everywhere. And they start swallowing. No, so they're unsure. They're poor. They don't know what's going on. And the rabbis tell them to pray. And they're nervous. The, the, the thing that they've been trying to do all this time finally happened. So it's hard. It's hard. It's a lot of pressure. Anyway, they do it. They do the blessing. We walk away. They get dressed. You know, we never see anybody naked. It's always covered. Uh, the woman, you know, goes into the mikveh with a robe, and even after she uh, takes off the robe, it floats. So no, nobody ever sees anything. Chas uh, shalom. It's not like the some people think that you. I actually had one person thought that um, the uh, for some reason somebody told her this, or she had this impression that the rabbis have to check her before she goes into the mikveh. Like, I don't know, somebody, I don't know where people get this crazy thoughts. This is, uh, has to be some type of anti-Semitic craziness. But anyway, uh, nobody touches, nobody checks, nobody, nothing. All we need to do is to see that a person goes into a, deep, into a mikveh. Uh, we don't see any nakedness whatsoever. We just make sure that they're in a mikveh. It's a kosher dip. We walk away. They get dressed after a while, and then they come back. And then uh, we go through the uh, process of, you know, giving them the certificate. They sign, and uh, that's it. I pay sometimes. And that's it. And then uh, at that point, it depends. You know, the person can have uh, their own celebration. person can uh, go out to, to dinner, go have a party. If they're getting married, like I had a couple of times, Hashem, they get, we do the ceremony right there and then. So that's a little ceremony. But uh, that's it. That's it. So, uh, really, the, the, biggest, the biggest thing of the, uh, the mikveh, uh, the biggest part of the ceremony is the mikveh. It's extremely uncomfortable, but 
it'll it'll take a couple of days for all of it to hit you. Sometimes it, just, it takes a couple of days for all of it to hit you, but it's a big thing. Next guy, you had a question, yeah. Okay. Uh, I know some people that go like after hours and they just break in and they go in. That's not allowed, right? No, it's stealing. Yeah, stealing. stealing. Yeah. So, uh, so it's like, for example, it's like I decided to go into your house, just take a few things from your fridge because you weren't there. That's stealing. Same thing. This simple man, they can go real mix with big food also. Yes, a, a, man, a man is not obligated to go to a mikveh. The problem with going to the ocean is a few things. Number one, you can't go to a place where there's other people. You can't go if there's, when you go, when you go, guy or girl. If you go to an ocean and there are women there, you have a very serious problem in Shammai. Why? It's better off that a person die than go to a beach where there's women in bikinis and, and bathing suits. It's Gilu Arayot. It's considered Areg Val Yavo. It's better off that a person die than go to a beach where there's women in bathing suits. This is Alakha. You can ask anybody you want that actually knows Alakha. That's Alakha. Guy wants to go to a, the, the local community pool. He wants to go to the hotel pool. And the hotel pool has the opposite uh, sex there. Woman or man has the opposite. A woman wants to go to, to, to the pool. And there's uh, men there. And she will. It's Arek Val Yavo. So, first rule guy wants to go to a beach, to go, wants to go to an ocean to dip in the mikveh. He has to be 100% sure that there's not going to be a single woman there. Single one. That's number one. Number two, it's dangerous. The times that you're going to go is the, worst, is, is the most dangerous time for the ocean. Really early or really late, it's the most dangerous time of the ocean. Why go? For what? For what purpose, what, what purpose are people doing this? So, in reality, the people that are going to... The ocean for, for, for mikveh purposes, many of them, not all of them, many of them are going for the wrong reason. They're not going because it's a mikveh. They're just going there because they want an excuse to swim naked. That's really what they want. They want an excuse to swim naked. That's it. I'm serious. No, this is, this is the real reason. Yeah, yeah this, is, this is the real reason. They want an excuse. Yesterday, they didn't have an excuse. Why? Everybody was wearing a bathing suit. If they want to sw- swim naked, it's like, oh, you're weird. What's wrong with you? Now you tell them, no, no, I'm a tzaddik. I'm like uh, Moshe Rabbeinu of this generation. I'm like, Moshe Rabbeinu of this generation. Why are you Moshe Rabbeinu? You start telling about the mikveh. It's like, oh, you know what? The guy who starts taking off their things. I'm Moshe. I'm Moshe. Everybody's Moshe. Why? They're all looking for excuses. They're all looking for excuses. So you know, let's spare each other the excuses. The reality is, you want to go to a mikveh? It's a perfectly decent one that you can find. If you can't find it, don't go. Don't go. A lot of problems with many mikvehs, by the way, because there's a lot of immodesty in mikvehs. So it's a uh, needless to say that you're not allowed to go to an immodest mikveh, uh, you know, um, even if it's a kosher mikveh. You know, if everybody walks around naked in this mikveh, you shouldn't go to the mikveh. Unfortunately, in many places, it's very, very normal for guys to walk around naked like the goyim do in the gym, in a locker room. You're not allowed to go to a mikveh like this. Why? You're not allowed to look at other persons, even if it's a man. You're not allowed to go look at other persons. Oh, I'm not looking. Doesn't make a difference. He's looking at you. Not allowed. So these are different things that you know a person needs to stay away from. And in reality, you should say thank you to Hashem that you're not obligated to go to a mikveh. Why? Because it's not an easy thing. It's not an easy thing. Not an easy thing. There's plenty of things that are much more difficult, that are much easier than that. And uh, you should do them first. Next question. Same price. Ken. Shaman, when the Shaman was going through some baggage in the first generation, and 
Almost all of us. Almost all of us. Uh, by the way, the, the camera stopped working about 40 minutes ago. The, the Facebook, just letting you know. So you can just turn it off so it doesn't kill the battery. Go on, please. Um, so the uh, Darizal says... The Rizal says that um, that when it comes to uh, neshamot, a person that does not understand that a neshama breaks up into many pieces, that not, does not understand even the basic minimum under, uh, required knowledge of neshamot. So neshama is similar to fire, where let's say for example you take one fire, one candle, and you want to light a second candle. Once you light the second candle, or even if you light ten candles, the original fire stays the same. It doesn't make a difference how many candles you've lit, how many more fires you lit, the original fire stays exactly the same. It doesn't go down. It doesn't lose any of itself. That's a neshama. So a neshama can be split into an infinite amount of pieces. There's no end of how many pieces the neshama can break up into. With that being said, once a part of the neshama did tshuva, it doesn't, necessar- it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to come back again because the rest of the neshama didn't do tshuva. So if, let's say, for example, if a person's eyes, if a neshama's eyes did tshuva, so, but the rest of the body still sinned, somehow, because usually all the sins start with the eyes. But let's say the rest of the body still sinned, so the person can be brought back into the world as a blind person. Why? Because the eyes don't need to worry. If you're going to bring the eyes again, then Hashem uh, Echem, most likely they're going to sin the second time around. So Hashem does this Neshama a favor, and the next time around, the eyes don't come. So the person comes to the world blind. Uh, because he has to fix the rest of the body. And so on and so forth. So, each one of us was at Mount Sinai. Every single one of us, including... Huh? No, no, every, it, that's what the Chachamim say. No, that's what the Torah says. No, that's what the Torah says. What the Gemara says. Every single nation. Right, exactly. Every single person that's alive, even the convert, even the natural born Jew, every single one, that Neshama was at Mount Sinai. Which means that Neshama has made a lot of mistakes for the last 3,300 years where certain parts of it had to come back. The original neshama 3,300 years ago was much bigger, much more extraordinary. But it didn't fix the whole thing. It fixed part of it, so the part that didn't fix had to come back again. The part that had to come back again itself fixed part of it, but not the whole thing. So the part that didn't even fix had to come back again. And then again, it fixed another part of it, but the, that part didn't fix the whole thing, had to come back again. Or maybe made new sins, then uh, had to create more problems for itself. And so on and so forth. So that Rizal explains that as far as the neshama, it breaks up into many pieces, but one of the things that already the um, Stipler Gaon said, already almost a hundred years ago, is that there's virtually no more Gilgulim. No one should depend on reincarnation anymore, already in his generation. Meaning, if you mess up now and you die, don't bet on coming back again. Don't bet on give, being given another chance. Uh, and almost there's almost no more new neshamot. There's almost no no uh, no no neshama. New means it's like a tzaddik that comes to the world, that's brand new, sinless, and so on. And Hashem usually brings some of these in order to bring life and kedusha to the generation. Yes. Same, Same price for one. So we all got kids going and you, whatever, you know. No. So my question is this. If he said that there's almost no Neshamot coming back, uh-huh. how come the population grew? Because the Neshama can, like I just said, the Neshama can break up into many pieces. So for example, so no, no, there's a proof. I'll give you a, I'll give you a Raya. Okay. Originally, we had who? We had Adam Arishon. Adam, yes. Adam, by himself. 
all of the neshamot that are alive today, that exist today, come from him. All of them. So, huh? Him by himself. That's it. Just him. No, no, not him and Eve. Just him by himself. All of the neshamot came from him. She, actually, there was more than one. There was more than one chava, one chava, by the way. But that's a story for a different day. There was more than one chava. One chava married Satan. One chava married Adam. Okay? So now, all of the neshamot came from him. Now, after a person fixes themselves, and he gets the Gan Eden, and he goes to Olam Abba, eventually the neshamot will go back to the source. Where is the source? We're all going to see where we fit in Adam Arishon. Before the official, official source, which is Hashem, Hashem, Hashem himself, but it's Adam Arishon. So we may be the toe. The other guy may be a finger. The other guy may be an eye, and so on and so forth. E- each one of us is in a different part of this big neshama that was originally created. I wasn't planning on giving you a Kabbalistic shiur, guys. This may be a charge. I may, ca- I may charge you for this one. I say same price, but this one I may charge you. But anyway, no, usually the Kabbalists, uh, they, uh, they, uh, they, they charge, guys. They charge. Kabbalists charge. So anyway, the, uh, the neshamot originally started with one. Now you have, he had two sons. Kain vehevel. Cain killed Hevel. Cain was the source of Tum'ah, came for the bad, evil of the world. Hevel came for the good of the world. Hevel died. He reincarnated as Noach. Noach died, reincarnated as Moshe Rabbeinu. Now, Cain, Cain had to fix himself. How could he fix himself? He committed murder. What did he commit murder for? He committed murder for because he was jealous of Abel for having two wives. Having to, each one of them was born with a twin sister, but Evel was born with two twin sisters. And in those days before the Torah, you were allowed, and actually uh, you had to marry your own sister because there was no other people. Anyway, so he had to fix this. He had to fix this. He had to fix this murder. So how? He had to come back, like you said, he had to come back as two people in the same generation. First, he had to fix the murder. How do you fix the murder? By being murdered. So what happened? Moshe Rabbeinu, which is really able, had to kill him back. Tikkun, finished. The other part, he had to fix the jealousy. Jealousy of a woman. What did he do? He had to come back as Yitro. What did Yitro do? He gave Abel, he gave Moshe Rabbeinu a woman. So he fixed that Tikkun. So we see from this example, the Zohar teaches us that one Neshama is alive in two people in the same generation. Needless to say, it could be multiple people. Needless to say, it could be multiple people in multiple generations. I sent you an article. Okay. I know you don't like to talk about it, but... Oh, Mashiach? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I no. Like to talk about it. Let, let me what about Mashiach? What about Mashiach? We answered a quick question about Mashiach on, on Wednesday. On, hold on. He was a blood, blood, blood moon. Blood moon, blood moon, locust, listen, uh, and all types of other things. Baruch Hashem. I know. No. Then the week before, seven countries, Malaysia, Africa, were they were drawing blood, same parasha. Then Egypt, before the blood moon, gets a storm that they, I believe they called prophetic, they called something out of prophecy storm. Mm-hmm. Same parasha, again, it's awful. And then Rav, uh, what's his name? Kenevsky. Kanievsky. Who you mention all the time. Yeah. Uh, he said a boy came to him uh-huh. that from America. Some, some I heard that article. Okay, so let me let me finish it. Okay, so you have anything more after that? So he said, I want to register so we can They're go. saying he said. They're saying he said. They're saying he said. But then it was it was confirmed That's correct. Hold on. by his assistant. The, the article says it was confirmed. The article says it was confirmed. The article says what's I want but, to know what is true. Okay, now, here's the thing. We already covered everything you said on Wednesday. You didn't come to the shul. I know. So punishment is you have to watch the shul. I did. It's the first 15 minutes. It answers your questions. First 15, 20 minutes answers your questions. But did you read the article I said? I read the article. I read the article. You think you're the only one that sent me the article? This is 37 people like you that sent me the articles, Baruch Hashem. That's how I get my news from people sending me. So now, okay. All of the signs... Perfectly fine. There's no problem. Yes, it's exciting and scary at the same time. Sounds good. It's exciting and scary at the same time. But all it is is Hashem trying to tell us that 
we need to do tshuva, which is what he's been telling us for 3,300 years. There's no chidush here. He's just trying to give us a little bit more of a push. For some people, it's going to work. For some people, it's not going to work. They need a bigger push. They need the, you know, the makat bechorot to come. They need the firstborn son to, to die. Why? Because some people are like Paro. Some people are like Paro. That's where it happens. They need, they need something tragic to happen before they do tshuva. That's a reality. Other people, as soon as they lose five dollars on the way to work, they do tshuva. Why? I say, oh, I did something wrong. Chatanu avinu pashanu, and that's it. They do tshuva. Other people, they need cancer. They need, uh, you know, the, all types of diseases to do tshuva. They need to be at the hospice center with five minutes to live before they uh, before they do tshuva. That's some people. Now, the signs are there even before this last month or two months, the signs have been there already for the last several years. We've had every single sign that we need for the Mashiach to come, with the exception of a couple. Biggest one we're missing is the Mashiach himself. But the Gemara says, what's going to happen before Mashiach comes? Here I brought one with me, actually. Apparently Hashem wanted you to know more signs. But I've gone over this before, so it's kind of uh, not a chidush. Of course he knew. Of course he knew. But I'm going to, before I answer what's going to happen, before I answer what's going to happen, a, uh, a person needs to know that when it comes to the uh, issue with Rav Kanievsky, right now, because he's considered, and he is, the one of the Gdoleado, there's literally a camera next to him at all times. So much so that every little peep that comes out of his mouth is on camera. It's no longer word of mouth. One time, he was leaving his house to go to Beknesset, like a regular tefillah. Nothing extraordinary, no special holiday, no nothing. He was just going to tefillah, and a couple of guys that wanted to uh, open a, a Bet Midrash wanted to get a blessing. That's it. Nothing extraordinary. This wasn't a special day. There's no special news network. Just a couple of guys want to open a Bet Midrash and they want the blessing of the Rav. And they say, Kvodav, Kvodav, please, please, we want to open a uh, Bet Midrash at Bet Shemesh. This is all being recorded. Rav Kanievsky says, Ah, in America? He doesn't know what Bet Shemesh is. Why? He's, his whole life is Torah. He has no clue. Bet Shemesh, Tel Aviv, he doesn't know all these things. He knows Torah. So this came out, this, this was on the news. Other times, they ask him all these questions, and when you ask him a question that's nonsense, like it's just a waste of time, he gives you, a, he gives you an answer that's a waste of time. He doesn't, like, leave me alone. Let me go back to learning. Just leave me alone. Look, meaning, every single thing that he says, good, bad, waste of time, whatever it is, is recorded. So for people to write a whole article about some type of communication that happened with some kid, or some young guy about some passport that he said don't renew because the Mashiach is going to come, but you don't have this one thing on recording, I'm having a very hard time believing it's real. Very hard time believing it's real. But the reality is, even if it is real, even if it is real, it doesn't matter. Why? We went over all of the reasons of why it doesn't matter last week. Last week, which is, Chachamim, have insights on possibilities on certain times that are more likely to be times of Mashiach but they don't decree no one decrees it other than Hashem now the Gemara says that there's going to be a few things that are going to happen before Mashiach comes Gemara Maseret Sanhedrin page 97a says Rabbi Yehuda Omer Dor Sheben David Ba David this is a section in this particular Gemara in Sanhedrin that starts talking about what's going to happen before Mashiach comes. It goes, it's extended, and it continues for a while, but this is just one of them. This is what Rabbi Yehuda says. Rabbi Yehuda says in a generation, before Mashiach comes, 
the meaning place will be used for znut, for licentiousness, meaning there's going to be so few people going to the Bet Midrash, so few people going to the Bet Knesset, that it's just going to be a place where jokesters show up to uh, meet girls, to do their business with girls. It's going to be like an empty place. Unfortunately, this is happening. Vagalil Yechrav. The Galilee will be destroyed. The Galilee will be destroyed. Vagavlan Yesham. And the Gavlan, the Gavlan, which is another name of a place, the land of Givil, it's also to the northeast part of uh, Eretz Israel, also will be desolate. The people of the border, which is uh, people that commute from place to place, like, uh, no, this is referring specifically to, to Am Israel. The people that go from place to place, they're going to wander from town to town, and no one's going to welcome them. So it's going to be people that... Uh, like, for example, there's the certain certain types of Jews, Israeli Jews or even American Jews, that go to different parts that are dangerous in Eretz Israel. And uh, anytime the government has a uh, negotiations, they uproot the neighborhood and they throw them out, they go somewhere else. And they're uprooted again, they throw somewhere else, all these places. Gush Katif and so on. And the wisdom of the scholars will decay. Is going to be less and less Talmidei Chachamim. Less and less, which is unfortunately happening. And people that fear sin will be despised. Meaning that if you talk about Yirat Shamayim, people are going to hate you. Kind of sounds familiar. Let me know if you guys picked that one up. Kelev. <laughs> Face of the generation will be the face of a dog. What does it mean, face of the generation will be face of a dog? Rashi says, in the name of his teacher, that actually in the generation of Mashiach, people will start looking like they're dogs. Now, I showed this in a lecture maybe three years ago, that I had a picture that scientifically was proven. Mamash, it was actually proven. I have a picture. I think it's in my house somewhere. Or you can look it up online. Um... Uh, that people actually look like they're dogs. You have pictures of people, and it, you show their, their headshot next to their poodle, their headshot next to their uh, bulldog, their headshot next to whatever dog they have. They actually do look like each other. So the first commentary by Rashi is actually true. Now, you can't check yourself because you have a dog. You have to have somebody else take a headshot of you, take a headshot of your dog. You say, yeah, they're going to start saying, come on, dog, come on, dog, and it's you. Come on, come on. Oh, it's you. Oh, sorry, Steve. Sorry, Steve. And you look at the dog. Come on, Steve. Come on, Steve. Hey, right, you look alike. That's going to happen. Come on, Steve. So now that's the one of the commentary. That's one of the commentaries. I used to. I used to. I used to have a dog. I probably look like him. No question. I don't know. So what am I going to do? I'm, it's not my fault. I'm uh, born in this uh, generation. Actually, it is my fault. Technically. <laughs> So now, technically, it is my fault. Now, uh, what else does it mean? This pnei adok pnei kelev. That generation of a uh, uh, this generation will be look like like a dog, face of a dog, face of a generation, face of a dog. Says that it's going to be a generation where people have no shame, meaning they'll do their business anywhere. This unfortunately has been. This is old news. Old news already. In the old generation, since you guys are so young. You guys probably don't even look at the history books. In the history books that I learned when I was a kid, when a person wanted to get married, when a person wanted to get married, Jew or not Jew, didn't make a difference. Jew or non Jew, he went to the father and he asked, Can I marry your daughter? Can I marry your daughter? Once the father said yes and everything is good, then they got married. You would think everybody's Jewish. You got married, and then they went into their house and they did their business over there. And no one ever knew and no one ever thought of whatever's going on behind closed doors. Today, Rabotai, you have 12, 13, 14, 15 year old kids doing their business in school. In school. 
But I'm not just talking about the public schools that I grew up in, that I had classmates, 13, 14 year old classmates with nine month old babies. I went to school, I went to high school, I had classmates, each one bigger stuff, do, do, do. Everybody's pregnant. Everybody's pregnant. Except me. I was skinny. But everybody else was pregnant. Why? Because that's the way of public school. But now you would think, oh, this is a problem for the goyim. But Hashem with Jews. No. I saw the same thing, unfortunately, in Jewish schools too, where you actually have mamash, certain rabbis decided that they don't want to follow halakha and decide to allow boys and girls that are teenagers to go to the same school and go and attend. So I, I spoke at a few schools where there was boys and girls and everybody said, no, it's not such a problem. As soon as I finished the shiu, I went outside of the class. I started seeing the, girl, the boys and girls in the Jewish school with the kippah and the skirt, but kissing each other. Making out in the hallway. Like, I, this is how I grew up in a public school 30 years ago. But they're doing it in Jewish schools now. Why? We have no shame. We have no shame. People do their business everywhere. People do it on TV. There are shows. I think there's one called Big Brother. There's a whole show about how you're going to share your business, not only with the local community, with the entire world. The entire world. They have the show also in Israel. Where they have, now it's not enough that you're already disgusting, that you do your business in public. No, no, no. You're going to put a camera that even the stuff that's in closed rooms, you're going to show everybody. It's a generation of no shame. Another commentary says, another commentary says, is that it's going to be a generation, the Malsha says it's going to be a generation of hypocrisy. Where before Mashiach come, people will appear on their faces to be loyal to people like they're like a dog is. A dog is kulolev, he's all heart, all heart. So a dog is never usually a normal dog, is never going to go against his owner. Even if the owner hits him, the dog still comes back and he wants to bite the stick, not the owner. Because the dog is a loyal animal. But the generation before Mashiach, people are going to look like they're loyal, but they're the ones that are cheating you. They're the ones that are stabbing you. They're the ones that are trying to go and be with Shem Echem. How many times have I heard stories where a guy is getting divorced because his best friend stole his wife? I had one guy, this Greek guy, I did some business with him, didn't really work out so well because he still owes me half a million dollars, but he said he'll pay me 90 days, that was 11 years ago, I think it's a little late. Anyway, uh, so this poor guy, this poor guy, why? I feel bad for him, even though he owes me a bunch of money that would actually be uh, fantastic to get it one day. Uh, why is he a poor guy? Why I feel bad for him? Because this guy had everything, but he gave control to two people. Who? His accountant and his wife. Guess what? <laughs> they left him alone, they got together, took everything. Accountant and the wife. Why? Because it's a generation that we have right now is so despicable that people... Mamash, they call themselves your best friend to your face while they're stabbing you, while they're feeding you poison. How many times you hear about, I hear stories of kids wanting to go against their own parents because of money issues, throwing them out on the street and stuff like that. Horrible, horrible things. Anyway, last one I'm going to give you about Pnei Adok and Pnei Akelev is from Arav Elchanan Wasserman, Allah Shalom. In Ikva de Meshicha, in, the, uh, in his book, talks about the Mashiach. He says a teaching that he got from his Rebbe, from Rabbi Yisrael Misalant, one of his Rebbe's. He says, Pnei Adol, Pnei Akelev, Pnei Adol, face of the generation, means the leaders of the generation. The leaders of the generation before Mashiach comes will resemble like dogs. How so? When a dog is walked by its master, it walks ahead. It walks ahead of you. You know, when you have a dog, the, the dog walks ahead of you, walks ahead of you, walks ahead of you. But if you get to a crossroad, the dog stops and looks back. Like, which one you want to go? Which one you want to go? Where? 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 He says, that's going to be the rabbis of the generation before Mashiach comes. 
They're going to pretend like they're leaders. They're going to pretend. They're going to go, oh, come on, guys, come on, guys, come on, come on, come on. But then when they get to a place where it's hard to tell people, listen, if you violate Shabbat, death penalty. If, you, uh, if you're married to a Goya, death penalty. And so they're going to get to a crossroad. So I say, what do you want? Where, which one do you want? To, which road do you guys want to go? Which road do you guys want to go? The generation is going to look like leaders. Rabbis are going to look like leaders, but in reality, they're going to be like dogs. Why are they going to ask the owner, where do you want to go? They're going to ask the Keilah, where do you want to go? So this is Rav Wasserman said this almost a hundred years ago. And the Gemara said it almost 2,000 years ago. So the Gemara continues that the truth will be absent, meaning that it's going to be a generation where it's going to be like if you want to hear Emet, you have to go to a shul where there's maximum 10 people. <laughs> if you have a shul and there's 550 people, 600 people, very rare for there to be Emet in the same place. Bemet, it's, it's uh, no, there are, st- uh, there are actually some rabbis that have merit that have 500 people and they say Emet. But Bemet, the, the, uh, the reality is, is that if, I was talking to you about business, you could fill up a room with 5,000 people. If I was talking to you about Shlom Bayit on a regular basis, 10,000 people. If I was talking to you about education of kids, like the politically correct way, 30,000 people. You could fill up stadiums. Madison Square Garden would be asking me when you want to book it again. Why? Because that's what people want to hear. Motivational stuff, Tony Robbins type of stuff. That's what people want. But unfortunately, that's not what gets people to do chuba. Because if you tell people the truth, people run away from it, like rats. In a generation of Mashiach, the Rambam himself says that not everybody's going to have the merit to do tshuva. The Gemara actually says in Tanit, not everyone will be happy when the Mashiach comes. Why not everybody's going to be happy? Because not everybody's going to survive. Not everyone's going to welcome the Mashiach with, with open arms because they're going to realize it's too late. Too late to do tshuva. So before, before Ben David comes, it's going to be a uh, generation where the truth will be absent. As it is said in a, uh, Isaiah 59, 15, and the truth will be absent, and he that turns away from evil will become foolish. So they ask, what does it mean? Come on, continues. What does it mean that uh, in this verse that he who turns away from, uh, you know, from evil is foolish? What does it mean? He says, you know all those people that are converting? You know all those people that are doing tshuva? All their friends are going to make fun of them. Ah, no, come on. Last week you went with us to the clubs. Why, you know, all of a sudden you're Moshe Rabbeinu. Ah, come on. Last year you were with us at the concert. Wow, all of a sudden you're Avraham Avinu. Ah, all the friends are going to make fun of them. Their own friends, their own family are going to be the Yetzara. Their own family are going to be the Yetzara. Which is the reason why you have to cut them off. You have to cut them off. In many cases, you have to cut them off. You can't even hate, save them. Why? Because they're destroying you. You have to run away from places like this. And unfortunately, today, here, many, many times, people that fall off, they don't fall off because the shoe changed. The shoe didn't change. The shoe is fire every time. What changed? They changed. In the beginning, they were focused on doing chuba, doing chuba, doing chuba. They watched the shield, they did what the shield said. After a while, they decided, you know, the Yetzirah gave them some thought, maybe you should go back to the old neighborhood and do Kiruv. In the name of Kiruv, you go to the old neighborhood and start talking to your old buddies in the projects. So he went to the projects, but he never came out. He went, he went to Taj Mahal, he never came out. He wanted to do Kiruv at the casino. He wanted to do Kiruv in the gym. He wanted to do Kiruv at the strip club. He wanted to do Kiruv at the nightclub. He wanted to do Kiruv at all at the soccer game. He wanted to do Kiruv there. He went there, he didn't come back. Why? The body came back, but the neshama, the tshuva, gone, left. Why? Because his friends now say, come on, no. how much fun did you have with us at the soccer game? How much fun did you have with us at the baseball game? How much fun did you have with us at the club having a couple of drinks? No, come on. Don't be a machmir like your rabbi. Don't be a machmir like your rabbi. Don't be like your rabbi. Okay, he's a rabbi. He has to do it. That's his job. That's his job. You know how you can be like us. Okay, keep Shabbat. Don't worry about it, but it's fine. We won't tell anybody. Well, you want to kosher, I'll bless it for you. When you kosher, I'll bless it for you. That's what people say. I tell you what. No, it's a steak. It's a steak. It's a filet mignon. No, it's good. Yeah, but it's not kosher. I'll bless it for you. Well, you need kosher, I'll bless it for you. Why? That's your friends. Your friends are going to make fun of you. 
You can't keep your old friends, you do tshuva. You simply can't. You have to stay away. Why? Because the Yetzirah is going to come to you. And it continues and it continues, Rabotai Karim, it continues, and it tells us that the danger is very, very much near. Now, with that being said, we learn from here that to do tshuva is not easy. So what Yitro did in this week's, last week's parasha is extraordinary. But we had a question. My Rav and I were learning. And Mamash, it was early morning. We're trying to get this question. We have a question. We have a Masha. It's a tough question. What's the question? The question is, it says that Yitro worshipped every single type of idol possible. Worshipped everything. But we see across the entire Torah that every time somebody's involved with heresy, a pikol suit, that type of behavior, they usually are involved with sex crimes. The heretics are usually sex addicts, promiscuous types of people. And you go across the board, Nebuchadnezzar had prophecy from Hashem, but was a homosexual, and as uh, the Gemara says, on a regular basis, one of, it, one of the ways he forced his control around the entire world is that every time he would get one of the kings to come visit him, he would rape him. Daryavish, Gemara Masechet Rosh Hashanah, page 4, says that Daryavish got to such a horrible level of promiscuity that Rabbi Nachman Breslov says that if someone is a Baal Gava, he has a lot of pride, naturally makes him promiscuous. But if he doesn't control his promiscuity, he's always going to need to get something more and more. Meaning, first, he's by himself. He's an addict, an addict with wasting seed himself. But that's not enough. So then he wants a new girl every week. But that's not enough. After a while, the girl's not enough. So now he wants guys. That's not enough. He goes on to animals. Daryavish got to animals. To such an extent that he had a throne for himself and he had a throne for his dog. Bemet. It's in the Pesukim Torah. He had a throne for his dog. Why? His, his, his queen was a dog. And there were several kings like this where their promiscuity was connected to their heresy. One of the other perfect examples is Jesus, J.C. Penny. J.C. Penny lost his Olam Bafawat for his promiscuity. He wasn't able to watch his eyes and eventually he wasn't able to watch his breath and he ended up losing his Olam Abba because of it. And all of the heretics have some type of connection to some, you know, some form of uh, promiscuity and, and things of that nature. But we, we don't see that. So that's a question. How, I mean, we see it across everyone else in the Torah except him. How could this be? So the truth is that Yitro, why did he have so many Abu Dazara, so many different types of Abu Dazara, because Yitro was actually looking for the Emet. He was looking for the Emet, so as soon as he worshipped an idol and it didn't work, and he saw it's nonsense, he switched immediately. He didn't stay a moron like some people worship a cow for 90 years until they realize the cow is not going to do anything other than moo. So he didn't do anything. Moo, moo. 90 years it's mooing. He thinks that maybe one day it's going to do a meow, but it's not doing a meow. It's moving for 90 years and 91 years. But it took him a long time. He told us smart. He saw this cow is never going to change. This bull is never going to change. This statue is never going to change. As soon as he's identified it's fake, he left it. He left Abu Dazara. He went somewhere else. And that's why he, he went through all of them. So that answer is why he went through so many Abu Dazara until he found God. But what's the answer for why he wasn't promiscuous? Because when you're really looking for the emet, you don't have time to be promiscuous. Because promiscuity, znut, occupies your mind. You're constantly chasing it. You're constantly looking for a new girl. You're constantly looking for a new high. You're constantly looking for a new thing to get off on. You're constantly looking for something. I remember as a kid... I was on football teams, and also I myself had clients that were football players and different athletes when I was in the business world. And I had people work for me, 
And literally, you can tell every one of the guys. I had, I don't know, 135 guys that I trained to work for me over the years. And I had, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds of clients. And some of them were young people. And you could pretty much tell from looking from, from now, from here, you could tell who's going to make it and who's not. How? How much of his time is occupied chasing girls? If his time is occupied with chasing girls, he will never be more than a one-hit wonder. Like, at best, he'll be a one-hit wonder. He'll make one, like, hit. He'll make, you know, a few hundred thousand or a few million, whatever it is. But after that, he's a loser for the rest of his life. That's the best case scenario. The rest of them are just losers for the rest of their life. Never hit. They never hit. Why? Because their mind, their whole self, their whole life is constantly revolved around their promiscuity. It's constantly they're chasing this. They're chasing this girl and that girl. And every day they compare phone numbers. And their lunch breaks, instead of eating, they're looking for girls. Where do they go eat? The place that has the most amount of girls. And after they come back from lunch, they show each other how, how many digits you get. How many digits you get. And they compare. And you hear this nonsense talk in the boardroom. It's like, this is what your life is about? And then as soon as they finish work, it doesn't matter, a long day, short day, they make a difference. Eight o'clock, they change their clothes and shh, they're back down to the clubs. What? More girls. And their whole life is constantly chasing girls. New one, old one, new one, old one, new one, new one. Every week is a new thing. And you compare stories in the morning. And then they wonder why they're 45 years old and still single. Oh, I couldn't find the right one. Yeah, you found everyone. You found everything until you don't even realize what's good, what's bad. You can't decipher. Sarai Menu can come to you and you wouldn't even tell. You would think, oh, it's just another girl. Everybody looks bad, good. It's you. You ruin yourself. You ruin yourself. It's even if you have a favorite dish. If you eat it every day for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, eventually you're going to hate it. Shlomo HaMelech says, Dvash Matzata Echol Dayeka. Kentis Be'ena Ve'ekiyato. Shlomo HaMelech says, if you found honey, eat a little bit at a time. Why? If you eat too much, you're going to throw up. When a person takes too much, too much, too much, eventually he loses everything. So we see that Yitro wasn't this promiscuous person because he was too busy looking for the truth. Now, from this same mitro, we're getting a huge amount of musal. That Itro is teaching us here that all he needed to do was hear. Vaishma Itro. He heard, and that was enough for him. Enough for him to do tshuva, enough for him to leave everything, enough for him to do everything. And become a Jew. Now, later on in the parasha, we see that Itro gives Musar to Moshe Rabbeinu. He tells him, what are you doing? You're going to be the judge for everybody? Now, if I was Moshe, if I was Moshe, you know what I told Itro? Itro, yesterday you worshipped a dog. Last week you worshipped a cow. Three weeks ago you worshipped an uh, uh, ant. Four weeks ago it was a statue. You're going to tell me I speak to Hashem face to face? You're going to tell me how to run the show? That's why I'm not Moshe, by the way. That's why I'm not Moshe. Why? Because I'd lose my cool on Itro. Who are you to tell me what to do and what to say? I'm Moshe Rabbeinu. That's why I'm not Moshe Rabbeinu. But Moshe Rabbeinu says, Psh, I'll take what you said to Hashem. You have an interesting idea. You're saying that I'm doing too much. I don't know about that. You're right. You're wrong. I don't know. I'll ask Hashem. Allah's Hashem. And Hashem says he has a good thought. He has a chidush. He has a chidush. Do it. Implement this system where until this day the judicial system that we have today, Supreme Court, Civil Court, all the different court systems that we have today, Congress, all the uh, ruling systems are based off of Yitro. Based off of this decision that Yitro made, based off this Musal that Yitro gave. From here we learn that musal and lessons is something that you take from anyone. David Melech says in Tehilim 119.99, Mikol melamdai skalti. From all of my teachers, I grew wise. David Melech, Kodesh Kodeshim, the father of the Mashiach, says, 
all of my from all of my teachers, I learned something, I became wise from them. Who are his teachers? Everyone. David Amelech says, Everyone was my teacher. The old man, the young man, my enemy, my friend, everybody was my teacher. The rabbi, the make pretend, everybody was my teacher. Comes his son, Shlomo Amelech, in Proverbs 6 6. And he says something more, 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 more deeper even. He says, Lech el nemala atzel red rachea vechacham. Shlomo HaMelech comes and tells us, Go to the ant, you luggard, you lazy bum. See its ways and grow wise. Shlomo HaMelech comes to us and tells us, Hey, what you think that my father meant that you just learned from people? No, learn from everything, even the end. Go learn from the end. Go learn Musaf from the end. The Gemara says, where can you learn from the end? So learn about Dinim Shel Gezel. You see, an ant, it lives only for six months. But it collects enough food during the first day that will last it for the rest of its life. But yet, you're never going to see one ant go on vacation to Cancun. You're never going to see an ant go on break for, for Pesach. It's going to work every single day until it dies. Chachamim asked the ant one time. They asked the ant, hey, you know you're only going to live six months. So the ant says, yeah, that's what they say. You know your cousin, he died exactly six months old. Yeah. You know your father died six months old. Your mother, six months old. Everybody's six months old. Yeah. Okay, but you collected all the food that you're ever going to need in your life already at one day old. Why are you still working already at your second month? Why don't you uh, relax? The end says, I don't know, maybe they give a deen in Shammai and they let me live longer. Maybe they changed the deen in Shammai for me, they let me live longer. Why? Because the Chachamim know how to speak to ants. We don't even know how to speak to people. The Chachamim know how to speak to an ant. Said, the, the, the ant said, why do we keep working? Because the ant says, maybe, they're gonna, maybe in Shemaim they're going to change my decree. They let me live longer. So I'm already ready. Alvayalenu. Alvayalenu, we think like this. We think like this. Oh, you know what? Maybe in Shemaim they're going to let me live longer. So I have to be prepared. With Torah, with mitzvot, with all the different things that I need to do. Now, the other thing that they tell you to learn from the ant is the dinim shel gezel, the stealing. Why? Because despite the ant working so hard every single day and collecting enough food for the rest of its life every day, it still never steals even a grain of sand. As soon as the ant goes to a grain of anything and it smells the smell of another ant, it immediately walks away. Immediately walks away. Why? This already belongs to somebody else. Alvaya Lenu to also be like the end. That as soon as we see something belongs to somebody else, we walk away. Sometimes you have certain people, they know it's somebody else's wife, but they dafka want to go talk to her. She knows he's somebody else's husband, but she dafka wants to talk to him. He knows this is his customer, but he dafka wants to get the business card from this guy. Maybe he'll do business with both of us. Everybody has some Yetzirah logic that tells them do this and do this and do this to show us that even the ant, the ant is someone we need to learn Musa from. If only, if only we learn this Musa not to steal. Now, Shlomo HaMelech tells us go learn from the ant, meaning go learn from anything. Anything from the shoe, from outside the shoe, from traffic, from problems from sickness, from anything and everything we're supposed to learn from. The Gemara says, in Masechet Baba Batra, page 23b, that if you find a chick, chickens, little chickens, roaming around, look for its nest within 50 amot. 50 amot. Why 50 amot? Because the Chachamim say that within 50 Amot, already the little chicks that they hop around, they can't fly yet. But already within 50 Amot, they've already gathered enough food 
that they're already satisfied, they're going to go back to their nest. And if once they go past 50 amot, which is about 100 feet, they can't see their home yet. So they're not going to go past it. So Rabbi Yirmiya, one of the Amoraim, says, what if you found a chick that has one leg within the 50 amot and one leg outside the 50 amot? How do you judge this chick? They took Rabbi Yirmiya, which if he's mentioned in the Gemara, that means he is able to revive the dead. They took him from the kolel, shoot, threw him out. Throw him out of the kolel. Throw him out of the bet midrash. So he said, why are we throw him out of the bet midrash? Just ask the question. The whole mind is full of questions. So what, Rashi says, why they throw him out of the, out of the, the bet midrash? He says, you're asking stupid questions. You're asking questions that mean nothing. Like, there's no purpose to your question. One leg in, one leg out. What's the, what's the nafkamina? What do we get out of this question? Where are you going with it? You're just wasting our time. You want to ask us about Mashiach when you haven't even done tshuva yet. You want to ask us about getting married. Uh, you know, what's the dinim between getting married but you're only seven years old? Like, what are you doing? <laughs> ask questions that are relevant. Ask questions that are relevant. Rashi says this. Tosfot says something else. The Tosfot says that when Rabbi Yirmiya asks, what do you do if the chick has one leg outside of the 50 amot, he showed that he's questioning the chachamim. He showed the avak, the dust of something like, maybe there's something wrong with Rabbi Yirmiya. Maybe he's a heretic. Why? Because the chachamim say, check up to 50 amot. Which means there's nothing beyond 50 amot. There is no such thing, 51 amot. If the Chachamim said the chick is not going to get to 50 amot, it's not going to say 51, there is no 51. You don't ask a question about 51. You don't think about 100 or 200. Why? Because the Chachamim know what they're saying. If you're questioning their measurement, you're questioning maybe there's something else other than what they're saying, maybe you don't have Emunat Chachamim. If you don't have Emunat Chachamim, get out of our call. You're not going to make it. You're not going to make it. Today there's a lot of people that have zero emunat chachamim. You tell them, yeah, the Rambam said such and such. It's like, yeah, I'm not really sure I agree with the Rambam. You're not sure you agree with the Rambam? Do you know how to spell Rambam? Do you know, can you compare yourself to the Rambam to even be in, the, put yourself in an equation where you allow yourself to disagree with the Rambam? The reality is that most people that have problems with Alakha, with Torah, with Musar, is because they over evaluate themselves. They think of themselves as much smarter than what they really are. And the worst part is, is that they think of themselves as much smarter than what they really are in the place that they're most foolish. When it comes to Torah, it's not a tic tac toe game that you learn the game within two minutes and you're finished comes to learn Torah, it's a lifetime of learning, it's a lifetime of doing, it's a lifetime of listening to an opinion that's much more superior than yours could ever be. It's a lifetime of submitting to Da'at Torah. And if a person is not willing to submit to Da'at Torah, they're just not going to make it. But Rabbi Ephraim also says something else that we can learn from this Ma'aseh, from the chicks, which is that, you see the Chachamim said, once the chicks get to 50 amot, you don't have to worry about finding them an owner because that's it. 50 amot is the limit. Rabbi Ephraim says that a person worries about things that are beyond his needs. Meaning, he has $50 and all he needs is $50. He needs 50 bucks to survive today. But already he's worried about tomorrow. He's worried about tomorrow's 50 Rav uh, Fahim says, if you have that worry, if you have $50 today, but you're already worried about tomorrow's 50 bucks, you're not going to make it in the Kodem. You're not going to make it in the Bet Midrash. They're going to throw you out. In Shemaim, they're going to throw you out. Why? Because Hashem gave you enough to survive today. So you learn today. Not worry about, spend your time worrying about tomorrow. Musar is something that we can learn from every single person. Musar is something we can learn from animals. 
Musar is something that we can learn even from an Arab taxi driver. Rabbi Fahim just a few days ago went to uh, speak somewhere and on the way home, the taxi driver was an Arab. And he says, you know, driving with an Arab taxi driver is much easier than in a uh, Jewish one. And I say, why? He says, because the Jewish one I have to calculate exactly how much time I have left for this ride to help him do tshuva. How long is the ride? 23 minutes. Okay, I have 23 minutes to get this guy to keep Shabbat. I have 23 minutes to save his olam haba. Oh, the ride's six minutes? I have six minutes to get this guy to keep Shabbat. Allah, that's what he thinks about with a Jew. He goes, with an Arab, I can just relax. I have to do nothing. I just relax. I do nothing. So when I was in his taxi with this Arab, he says to me, oh, you know, the Arab was talking. I said, you know, tell me one of your stories. He asked the Arab, tell him a story. Instead of Arab Ephraim talking usually, he says, the Arab, you talk. You give me one of your stories from your people. And the Arab says, he says, you know, you, you people like you, the best. He says, why? He says, you know, there was other people, they're also Jewish, but they're not like you. They don't have kippah, they don't have, uh, they're secular. He said, he calls them kufrim. He says, those people, no good. I took a group of them in my taxi for six hours, he says. For six hours, I take them in a taxi. Then after six hours, we stop by one of their houses, and they, um, the guy comes out, he says, okay, I'm going to go inside and I'll be back. And he leaves his girlfriend inside. In my taxi. And the guy, we wait 5, 10, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. He's not coming out. So the girl says, okay, let me go check on him. And he's, the Arab guy says, no, no, no. From my experience, he already knows this is all trick. Once she leaves, they're not coming out. So he says, no, 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 you're not leaving. Until he pays me, either you pay me or you're not leaving. She starts fighting, screaming. The cops come. They arrest everybody. The Arab guy is at the... Precinct, he tells them the story of what happened. You look at these guys, they're running away from me. They, I've been driving them for six hours. Police officer says, listen, buddy, there's nothing we can do. You could either go to court and waste more time or another few hours here. You could just let it go and just take the uh, hit and not get paid for the six hours worth of work. And then the Arab guy gives us a Musa lesson forever. He says to Rabbi Fahim, he says, you know, with you people, with you religious ones, this is never a problem. None of these things ever happen with religious people. He says, if a religious people with a keeper like you comes to my cab, he tells me, wait for me six hours. I wait for him. Because I know he's going to pay me. If a, if a person with a keeper, for religious people, they come to me, they say something, I believe him. I wait for them all day. But the other ones... If they don't pay me up front now, I'm not even taking them five minutes. We get a Musar lesson from what? An Arab taxi driver. That the educational system of that Israel works. Works. It simply works. It's not even a matter of do you keep Shabbat, you don't keep Shabbat. It's just a matter of are you a decent human being or not. And we'll finish off with this last Gemara of what's the difference between a dog and a king. The Gemara in Masechet Sanhedrin, page 24a, says, what's the difference between a dog and a king? You're going to say, well, uh, you know, dog has a leash. Technically, some kings have a leash too. They have chains, they have all types of things. And say, oh, uh, and not necessarily all dogs have leashes. There's plenty of dogs that don't have a leash. Say, well, they, uh, the dog eats whatever he wants. Sometimes the king eats what he wants. And there's plenty of things that a normal person would say is the difference between a dog and a king, but the Gemara answers something different. The Gemara says that a dog is only concentrating is all of his effort on enjoying himself, bringing pleasure to himself. He cares less about whether other people are having a good time. He's simply looking to fulfill his own desires. A king, if he's a real king, 
is a quality king all he cares about is bringing pleasure to others helping other people the king that has the power all he cares about is is everybody happy is the food good is the room good is this good he's never worried about himself why is no time to worry about himself he's constantly worrying about everyone else and a person needs to ask themselves am I a king or a dog how much of me is a king and how much of me is a dog how much of me is worried just about myself and how much of me is worrying about other people the more I worry about myself the more I am like a dog the more I start worrying about other people the more I act like a king sometimes you have couples that come and they want you to help them with shlom bite and you start asking questions and after all the lies stop eventually the truth comes out and you start seeing that this is a game of back and forth oh how come you didn't cook for him oh because he doesn't make enough money Oh, how come you didn't buy her the present oh because she doesn't clean oh, how come you don't do this because he doesn't do this how come you don't do that because he doesn't do that you know what we call this our friend calls them is a couple of dogs why because all they want this couple this couple all they want is the other person to give them pleasure if you give me pleasure I'll give you you know it's back and forth back and forth back and forth, just a couple of dogs daughters not a couple of human beings it's not a king and a queen if all you're worried about is when is he gonna buy me something when is he gonna do this for me when is he gonna make me this when is she gonna do this for me when is she gonna make, do this for me if you're always worried about when they're gonna do for you then you're just a dog you want to be a king act like one this is Musa that we get from dogs from ants from cats from Chachmenu Zichonam Livracha any questions yes Judicial system, yeah. Yeah, and this is and Moshe, Moshe also you know talks to uh Hashem about it and Hashem mm-hmm. approves. We we learn that uh the, the Chachamim say that later on Moses kind of rebuked the people for actually going along with that. Uh in the commentary I read, they say later on he would you know rebuild the people in a way that even the Chachamim say you know you should have. I mean he said they say. I'm honestly not familiar with the Midrash that you're talking about. It sounds more like Shmuel. That Shmuel rebuked the people for wanting a king. Uh, when they asked for a king, and he said you shouldn't ask for a king, you had Hashem as your king. So that's what it sounds like. But uh, you may be right, I'm just not familiar with it. To be honest with you, I have to look into it. Uh, because it's a... Uh, the, obviously there has to be a little bit more details to it. I'm just not familiar. Not, um, I mean, uh, Moshe Rabbeinu, uh, from everything that we see, Moshe Rabbeinu honored Yitro, and Hashem, and he also knew that Hashem gave Yitro this thought. It's not like a, um, this was a thought that Moshe Rabbeinu was incapable of, of having himself. Uh, there is a uh, teaching from Chazal that I actually heard from uh, Rabbi again, I believe it was. Uh, that says, how come, how come uh, Moshe didn't implement this simple idea by having uh, messengers, by having uh, servants, by having other judges, by having employees, and so on? Is because simply Moshe Rabbeinu knew something that Ito didn't know, which is that all of the power that he needed 
to implement, to, to be able to do this, was God's power anyway. Which meant that Yitro was wrong. But there is no such thing as Moshe Rabbeinu not having the strength to do it. Because Moshe Rabbeinu never had the strength for it. It was all Hashem anyway. It was all Hashem anyway. So Moshe Rabbeinu never got himself to a point of thinking that maybe I should get help. Because it's not me anyway. I'm not doing anything anyway. It's all Hashem anyway. Itra wasn't at that level yet to realize that everything is Hashem. Not just some things are Hashem. So he said, oh, you need help. Moshe Rabbeinu said, I need help. I'm not doing anything. I'm not doing anything. It's all Hashem. So that's the, that's the, that was the mindset of, of Moshe Rabbeinu. So what you're saying is a little bit of a kashya on it. There's a little bit of a contradiction on it where you're saying that maybe Moshe Rabbeinu wasn't happy that the people accepted it, but that's, I have to find a source for that. I'm just not familiar with it. Because everything I've read is uh, different from it, but there's uh, multiple opinions on, on, on certain things, but they all fit within each other. They're not necessarily multiple in a sense that they contradict each other. The multiple is that there's multiple facets to the same diamond. Just have to see how uh, how it all fits in. I'm just not familiar with that facet yet. But Hashem, maybe due to your merit, I'll uh, in question. I'll uh, look into it and let Hashem find it. But said the we have another shiur on Tuesday night uh, at the um, Breslov Center, Beis uh, our Musar series, Beis and uh, hopefully we'll get further along with uh, Tshuva. Amen.